In this video you will learn how to use a spreadsheet tool designed to determine the appropriate time of day to use permissive left turn phasing or flashing yellow arrows. Flashing yellow arrow traffic signals include a flashing yellow arrow signal head in addition to the standard red, yellow and green arrows. When illuminated, the flashing yellow arrow allows waiting motorists to make a left hand turn after yielding to oncoming traffic. This tool was developed by the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Transportation for the Minnesota Local Road Research Board to provide traffic engineers with better understanding of how the risk for left turn crashes varies during the course of a day. As part of this tutorial, you will learn what hours of the day flashing yellow arrows should be used. You will also learn some of the methodology used to develop the tool and how to use it. Then the use of the tool will be demonstrated using an example intersection. The tool works by the entering information about uh, your intersection into the spreadsheet, which will create a graph that suggests which hours of the day will operate best using flashing yellow arrows. In order to run the tool, you will need to know the number of opposing lanes geometric measurements of your intersection, uh, which can often be measured using an aerial photo of your intersection. The speed, the speed limit and a minimum of six hours of turning movement counts. If your intersection has sharp horizontal or vertical curves, you will need to use other methods to calculate the available sight distance that is needed to use this tool. Keep in mind that this spreadsheet is a tool that traffic engineers can use as guidance in making a decision about when to use flashing yellow arrows. However, you know your intersection best and your experience and engineering judgment should be used to make your final decision. Now let's take a look at the tool. It has five different tabs or sheets. The first two tabs are basically the interface of the tool and the last three are only underlying information that the macro program uses to produce the final results for you. So you don't need to worry about these three sheets. They are even locked from you. You don't need to change or even look at anything in these ones. So we're going to focus on the first two sheets. In, in both sheets, the green cells are input cells and most of the remaining parts are locked. The first sheet is called SD issue. SD stands for sight distance. So it takes in mostly geometric measurements from you for the intersection approach of interest, including the number of opposing lanes, opposing speed limit, left turn offset intersection length, etc. It prepares some inputs to the second sheet and the second sheet identifies the intersection category we're dealing with and applies the appropriate statistical models for it. Also, there are two other pieces of information we need to input here. The first one is base condition and the second piece is available turning movement counts. Now let's implement an example. For example, I chose this intersection in St. Paul. It's McKnight Road and Burns Avenue intersection. It's a typical intersection and we are specifically interested in southbound in this example. So let's see what the first question in the tool is. The first question is, is there any opposing left turn movement? And the answer is yes, because we're interested in southbound, we do have an opposing left turn movement or lane. So you put Y here. The second question, number of opposing lanes. And when we say opposing lanes, in this context, we mean any lane that a left turner need to yield to. So we should consider through and right turn both. Here we have three lanes, so you put three there. The opposing speed limit is 40 miles per hour, so we keep that. And the left turn offset is the next important input. Let's take a look at the definition of left turn offset. Left turn offset is the lateral positioning of two opposing left turn lanes. This diagram explains three different situations. In the leftmost one, which is case A, you have the most common situation, a negative offset. Usually when you have median, you will have a negative offset, which means you have a shorter sight distance. Case B is a typical no offset situation and case C illustrates a positive offset. Based on this definition, you can identify your left turn offset. Here, if you measure the left turn offset, you will see it's six feet and it has to be negative based on that definition. So you put negative six here. And the intersection length, which is from this point to this point, from the two edges of the intersection, you will see it's going to be 85 feet. 
For the remaining variables, you can usually use the default numbers because they either have minor impact on the intersection approach categorization or don't variate much. The first one is the width of opposing through lane for which the default is 12 feet. Also, opposing left turn lane width is 12 feet. YI is the longitudinal distance of driver's eye from the edge of the intersection. The default value for this variable is zero, which means driver's eyes align with the edge of the intersection at the time of making a decision about accepting or rejecting the existing gap in the oncoming traffic. Only if your intersection is too wide, so most of drivers proceed into the intersection while waiting for an adequate gap, you may want to use a positive value for this variable. VW is the width of predominant vehicle. XL denotes the lateral positioning of the opposing left turn vehicle from the median, and XI is the distance between driver's eye and the left edge of the lane. You can find more information about those variables below the figure. Now, the required sight distance and available sight distance are calculated based on your inputs. These two variables identify whether or not you have sight distance problem. The outputs of the first tab are inputs to the second sheet. Those outputs are opposing speed limit and sight distance situation. In this case, we do have sight distance problem. From these two information, the second tab identifies the category this approach belongs to and automatically applies their respective beta coefficients for the statistical models. If in the first tab the left turn offset was zero, we would have no side distance problem, which results in a different category with different beta coefficients. And that's how your first tab inputs play, play a role in your final results. Let's go back to our example. The next piece is identifying base condition, which is very critical. Base condition is condition at which the maximum acceptable risk for a left hand crash occurs. So let's see what recommended numbers for that base condition are. There are different sources available. I'm going to give you three of them here. The first reference, FHWA Signal Timing Manual, has this flowchart as a guideline for determining left turn treatment. In the bottom of the diagram, you will see for different number of opposing through lanes, it has two different thresholds for cross product of left turn volume and opposing volume. If you have one opposing through lane, this threshold is 50,000, meaning that if the cross product is greater than 50,000, you should use some kind of protected phasing. If you have two plus lanes, the cross product of these, these should be greater than 100,000 in order for you to use a protected phasing. The second guideline is very consistent with the first one. HCM 2000 has this left turn treatment worksheet and you can find this information in the bottom of it. For one lane, it suggests the same threshold, 50,000. However, instead of two plus lanes in the previous reference, here it breaks it down to two and three lanes and suggests 90,000 and 110,000 respectively, which is quite consistent with the previous guideline. And the last guideline is MnDOT tra Traffic Signal Timing Manual. For one opposing lane, it suggests 80,000, but for two plus opposing lanes, it suggests the same threshold, 100,000. If you decide to choose a higher base condition, it means you're taking a higher risk because your relative risk is going to be lower. Further research needs to be completed on to determine the appropriate values for, for the base condition. It's important to balance the safety and efficiency of your intersection by using engineering judgment when selecting your base condition. Okay, let's get back to our example. Because in our example we have two plus opposing lanes, we should use 100,000 as our threshold according to all of those three references. Any reasonable combination of left turn volume and opposing volume with cross product of 100,000 could be your base condition, such as 250 and 400 or 200 and 500. Here I'm using 250 for left turn volume and 400 for my opposing volume. And the last piece of information is the available turning movement counts. You can use turning movement count data from any available source. At this location, we have 13 hours of turning movement counts available. We are interested in southbound left turn and northbound through plus right turn. I already pulled this information into a spreadsheet so I can now readily copy them into my spreadsheet tool. 
you should make sure you are placing those counts into the right cell. The number noted in the sampled hours row represents the end of the time period. So for example, sampled hour 7 represents the time from 6 to 7. Based on this convention, our counts here span from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now you need to estimate the non-sampled turning moment volumes. You should press this run button to calculate the non-sampled hours based on the provided sampled hours. Down here you will get 24 hour turning moment counts and their associated standard deviation or uncertainty. And from some intermediate calculation you can get your updated daily relative risk diagram. Now let's see how you should interpret this diagram. For example, for hour 8, which is 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., your relative risk is 1.55, which means the risk for a left turn crash at this time on this approach is 55% more than the risk under the base condition. Your base condition was the maximum risk you wanted to take, and here at hour 8, it's 55% higher than that. So you definitely want to run this hour as protected. Also for hours 17 and 18, the relative risk is higher than 1.0. So these are also the other two times of day you want to run it as protected. It seems for the remaining hours of the day, the relative risk is 1 or below 1, which means they are within the risk range you decided to take. For non-sampled hours, you can see some error bars here, which accounts for uncertainty for the estimation process. Okay, this is the final product of the tool which gives you more information about the risk for a left turn crash that you can use for signal timing. Each one of the 24, out, 24 points on the daily diagram is an output of the contour diagram. This process is automatic and, and the diagram has been provided here only to give you additional insight. So you don't need to use the contour diagram yourself unless you want to perform other advanced analysis such as distribution of historical crashes on the relative risk diagram. Let's see what would have happened if you didn't have 13 hours of turning movement counts available. Let's remove some of these uh, off-peak hours and see the results given 8 hours available. So you need to rerun the program and it updates the diagram for you. As you can see the new diagram looks like the previous one to a very good extent except that it now has some error bars for those removed hours. But the general shape of the diagram is very close to the previous one, which means this tool does a very good job in terms of estimating non-sampled hour volumes based on a reasonable number of sampled hours. Even if we remove those uh, noon hours and redo the calculation, again the shape of the diagram is very close to what we had except that we have error bars now here. And the last recommendation is that please have at least 6 hours of turning movement counts available. That's the minimum thing I would recommend in order to get a reliable output from this tool. 3 a.m. peak, 3 p.m. peak, or maybe 2 a.m., 2 noon, and 2 p.m. hours. Under no circumstances, insert any row or column in this spreadsheet tool because the macro will crash. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you found this tutorial helpful. For more information, you can visit the Men.Research Services website.